Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jason Oates, the founder of the non-surgical penis augmentation procedure that we call Calibre. People call me the dick doctor, and I'll be talking all things penis, including size, shape, and function. Hello everybody, Dr. Oates here, one of the dick doctors, and uh, today on our podcast we have another uh, guest interviewer, Dr. Joe Milios. Dr. Joe Milios is a research fellow at uh, UWA and she'll be telling us what she's researching about in just a moment. Uh, she's a physiotherapist uh, for Men's Health Physio uh, and she'll be explaining to us why she's a real doctor in a moment. Uh, and she'll also be telling us a bit about Prost and Prost.com. So welcome, Joe. How are Thanks you? so much, Jason. It's really nice to be there. And here with you. Okay, so so you've got a, a a PhD. What did you do research on and get a PhD in? Uh, so the PhD was um, primarily about trying to improve quality of life outcomes in men undergoing surgery for prostate cancer. So patients who had radical prostatectomy, mostly because they have um, urinary incontinence and sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction following their treatment. And this can greatly impact on their quality of life. So my goals were to try and um, basically provide training programs specifically on the pelvic floor that might actually help them recover from these two expected side effects uh, quicker uh, than what might otherwise happen or to uh, more broadly educate others on the way physiotherapy has a role in helping men. Oh. So Very my PhD good. was over a seven year period. <laughs> a seven year period. Yeah. So like most yeah, people so end up with a, with a PhD, yeah, I was working. hating the subject, hating the people that you work with and never want to talk about it ever again. Or you were fine. No, I've had a lot of community. Yeah, I've been fine. I had a lot of community um, opportunities um, dealing with many, many ongoing aspects of it. Not so that chance to do education and um yeah, it, it's not a tiresome topic at all. It actually keeps on changing too, so that makes it more interesting. Oh, okay. And then talking about that sort of education and talking about it, uh, obviously you're also a co-host of the uh, the Penis Project, the other penis podcast, uh, which also comes from Perth, Western Australia. Amazing how both of the penis uh, podcasts um, come from the same place, <laughs> virtually started up very similar sort of times. Yeah, that was kind of crazy, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyway, okay. So, um, you talked about uh, you mentioned pelvic uh, pelvic floor and pelvic floor exercises. Um, I think people hear about that for women, you know, to stop women with urinary incontinence, so that when they're exercising, coughing or laughing, that they don't leak a bit of urine. But um, you've uh, developed something there on the men's side for that. Yeah, so a lot of um, men, as you say, um, probably don't even have to worry about continence issues or pelvic floor training until something actually happens to them. And that's, you know, basically seen as the women's business. And uh, I must confess that most of my patients are unaware they even have a pelvic floor when they first meet me. So my programs are all about how to identify where the pelvic floor is, how to get it training, and how to provide uh, a program that's targeted to their specific needs. And it might not be just prostate cancer. There might be um, erectile dysfunction, or there might be bladder control, or a, a range of things that the pelvic floor muscle is associated with. Um, also bowel issues. So there can be bowel incontinence, which is a topic that isn't, um, you know, so easy to talk about and certainly not to seek help for. So my so, training programs are designed to be simple. So bowel incontinence. So that's like having a, a, a leaky bum, leaking poo. Yep, yep. Um, it can also mean that you have no control over wind so that, that that's also considered um I thought that was normal. <laughs> Under your control, yes. <laughs> but yeah, there's people that have, you know, gas leaking when they don't want it to and that's embarrassing so yeah that's considered right. another form of incontinence I was going to say, both of my children have that but they don't find it embarrassing in any way 
Um, no, my three children as well. <laughs> okay. But um, so, it's always a fair command. So a man has a pelvic floor and by exercising his pelvic floor, he can improve all of these areas. Yeah, so depending on what the problem is, um, physiotherapy based approaches have had a lot of research in women's health. And the last um, seven or eight years, it's really exploded in, in men's health. So we have um, assessment techniques that are using real time ultrasound. So it makes it a less invasive technique. And when we work out what the problem is, whether or not it's a weak or a tight pelvic floor, then we develop um, treatment programs around that. Okay. Now, where are you sticking this um, ultrasound probe? Because I know ultrasound probes can get put in all kinds of weird places. Well, the simplest way is to put it on the abdomen, just um, above the pubic bone. So we call that the transabdominal approach. But okay, we also no, can put I'm it between the legs. A, um, ultrasound on my on my tummy. That's good. And that gives a simple view. It's a really quite a good first starting point. But then we have a uh, transperineal option, which is placing it in the um, area underneath. Basically, we get uh, between the legs, we get guys just, we drape them. So we give them a towel and just ask them to move their scrotum and penis to one side. And then we just put the ultrasound probe onto their perineum or the pelvic floor area. Yeah. So that's that space underneath the scrotum in front of their, um, their anus, the opening of the Correct, bone. yep. Okay, great. Yep. They don't and have to get up inside. No, there's no, no need to do that. Oh, okay. Well, that's one encouraging sort of. Okay. And so with the ultrasound, you can actually visualize the, the muscles of the pelvic floor and demonstrate the guys sort of contracting it and they can learn that feel, can they? Yeah. So we asked them to just imagine what it's like to be busting to do a wee and that need to have to hang on. So they'll tend to want to squeeze their, or we ask them to squeeze their front passage like they're stopping the flow of urine okay. and then to... Um, think of drawing their testes up um, okay, and their yes. penis in. So it's like a, a three muscle approach there. Okay. And I'm trying um, it right now, I get that <laughs> feel. Okay, good. So, I like to use the term lift your nuts to your guts. Nuts to your guts. Okay, now that's a term that yeah. guys can understand. Lift your, and exactly. not with your hands, but using no, your muscles internally, usually. nuts to yep. guts. Okay, so guys are lifting their nuts. So they, they do that once and they've done their exercise, they can crack a beer and watch the football. It's a little bit more than that. It's um, to do a combination of rapid pelvic floor contractions. So that's using our fast twitch fibers. So that does help with those things you mentioned, like coughing, sneezing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like bending, moving, and then some, they take about one second each. We tend to do one of those. And then we like to do some holding ones to help endurance. So that enables men to get to the toilet and hold the urine or their bowel motions without there being any accidents. So that's usually practicing uh, 10 where they hold for 10 seconds while they keep breathing and then to repeat that five or six times a day. Okay, Joe. so you were saying 10 reps of holding it for, for 10 seconds each with a little gap in between. So it's taking them a couple of minutes to do that series of exercises and then you wanted them to do it about half a dozen times in a day. So about yeah. 12. So if they're training for, yeah. So if they're training for an operation for say their um, removal of their prostate, then we do want them to um, do lots of them to try and build up that muscle uh, quickly. But in terms of um, everyday situations, usually three or four sets is enough um, for ongoing maintenance. But like women would encourage most men if they can to just get into the habit of knowing where their pelvic floor is and then to. Um, work on um, anything that they might need to. And if they can do it in standing, it actually gives them a much better training effect. Oh. Also, they can check and make sure that they're doing the action correctly. So it's really typical for men to do what we call overactivity of the abdominal muscle. So they'll use their abs and squeeze in their tummy and push really hard, squeeze their buttocks. And they don't need to do that. It's a very gentle exercise. Okay, yeah. So and that's why it's useful to have a, a physiotherapist train you to do it so that you can actually uh, do it correctly and get the most benefit out of it. Correct, yeah. <laughs> and uh, are, are guys compliant with, with this? Because 
you know, it's like a lot of these things, you know, I should exercise more, diet more, drink less. And then, you know, then I'd have a six pack and I'd love to have a six pack, but I don't. So do guys do this? Uh, look, guys are really, they are so compliant because they really don't want to be dealing with these issues. And I've never met a man who's keen to wear continence pads. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of evidence to say that it works and they're probably the most compliant um, group of patients I've ever worked with in actual fact. They're, they're really wonderful to work with. Okay. So they start the exercises, say, before they have prostate surgery, because in the prostate surgery, it's routine to have nerve damage. And when you wake up, you're going to be impotent and incontinent. And then you want to work to get this all back again. Uh, yep, that's absolutely correct. Yep. Okay. And um, so we've been hearing that uh, it's common for it to take maybe a year, sometimes two years to get uh, an improvement in the erectile function. But um, uh, the, the continence function, is that better, worse? Usually a lot better than that. So it's a muscle that can be trained. I tend to think it takes about three months. Uh, so if they have a month preparation time before their surgery, it may take two months for them to get continent and out of their continence pads. Um, some men are a lot quicker than that. Some are, are longer than that. But if men aren't cured of their continence by 12 months post-op, then we always offer them the opportunity to have surgery to provide a cure, which is either in the form of a sling or something called an artificial urinary sphincter and that's you know really for men who leak a lot quite excessively whereas the sling is for men who have um, much milder leakage but it's still quite bothersome uh, so typically it's a variable I say three months is should approximately for how long it takes but many of my patients in fact in my research one in six men never actually had that incontinence issue when it comes to the sexual function we also get men nowadays um, emerging with compromised function um, that's a, a lot shorter duration than what it might have been previously. And that's all to do with the sophistication of the things like robotic surgery and the surgeons who are actually doing those being more experienced. So we do get men who have much quicker recovery with erectile function. But in our research, it only states about 30% of men will get their sexual function back after two, two years. Um, so that's not, not very good results, um, which is why I wanted to do my research and try and push that along a little bit. Okay. Okay. And are, are there, apart from an improvement in continence, uh, and an improvement in erectile function, are there other benefits that men get from doing these pelvic floor exercises? Uh, well, psychologically, I think it's really beneficial because they're actually doing something to help themselves, not just waiting, um, you know, kind of for a doctor or a physician to fix them up. So the other thing is in the PROS group that I run, it's a big part of the um, program. So with every exercise session we do, we introduce the nuts to guts exercises. So all up, um, let's put it there, all up, we just... Um, have the opportunity to work in a group environment, which is also psychologically beneficial and also uh, socially, they can chat to one another about what sort of problems they have. And then their nuts to guts exercises becomes part of um, normal conversation. And they give each other lots of encouragement. So believe it or not, doing nuts to guts exercises, <laughs> we've even got stickers in our cars. It's a, it's a bit of a community awareness so, program as well so it's, it's it's like doing your any other uh exercise class a, a boot camp aerobics guys all get in there they've got their their, their nylon shorts they're singlet a sweat band on their head and um yeah yeah all of that <laughs> and uh and do and do their nuts to guts exercises oh, that's awesome do you play um olivia uh newton john let's get physical in the background I, I actually um, haven't had that request before, but uh, yeah, it's basically a gym-based circuit program and every exercise, whether it might be, you know, squats or shoulder press, we try and incorporate the pelvic floor. So it becomes part of um, a reflex or like an automatic thing for when they are in um, everyday situations. 
Okay, yeah. So you're doing all these other exercises, part of a circuit, and they're exercising their pelvic floor. And as you say, then they just learn they can do their pelvic floor exercises in, in any exercise sort of time. I guess anytime you're standing up, you could be sitting there squeezing. Can you tell when a guy's standing there and exercising his pelvic floor? Does, does it have a certain facial expression or? Yeah, they tend to pause and look into the distance and um, a lot of partners and wives do that to me, I always know, because he just shuts off from everything else. So the old uh, phrase about doing not being able to do two things at once is something that guys say to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's pretty much clear that nobody can really do two things at, at once. So you, can, you can do two things and spread you know, them over a, a twice as long a period, but it's hard to do two things in the time span that you can just do one thing. I can remember I went yeah. and looked at the original Kegel's description of pelvic floor exercises. It was an ancient sort of paper, but it was it was full on exercise. I, I think it was like wanting you to do 60 minutes of exercises and, you know, describing how you're supposed to end up sweaty and exhausted at the end of it. So, um, so it is, it's a real exercise. Mm. It's not just yeah, but um, it's invisible. It's invisible. No one else should be able to know that you're doing it. So you can do it anywhere, anytime, in actual fact. But yeah, the best training effect is usually in standing. Okay. Apart from the looking off into the distance sort of thing that nobody else knows. Now, yeah. when we were um, corresponding, um, you did mention one interesting thing, which was hard flaccid syndrome and uh this is not something that i'd really come across before hard flaccid syndrome so can you tell me what hard flaccid syndrome is so this is a presentation that's only sort of been um recognized in the last two or three years it's when guys present with a semi-permanent erection which is something that they don't want and it's actually quite painful and um, their pelvic floor muscles are often overactive. So instead of them um, only being erect at a time when they want to be in pleasurable situations or, <clears throat> excuse me, with their nocturnal erections when they're asleep, um, this, this is a situation that's challenging because they can't get the erection to go down. And it's because they've got trapped um, blood in their uh, penis. And a lot of the time it's from um, stress and even trauma. So there's something known as jelking. I don't know if you've heard of jelking before. Yes. Yeah. In fact, we're soon to have a, a, a session on um, jelking with a, a jelking expert, so to speak. Um, yeah. So jelking is an ancient sort of stretching type exercise to try and increase the length and size of the penis. Mm. So it's it's associated with being doing too much jelking and causing some penile trauma in actual fact. And then um, particularly in the UK, I've got colleagues who are very um, concerned about this and probably with its association with a lot of the online pornography and more accessibility um, to this, especially in lockdown time. They've had <clears throat> many more cases in the last year or two um, since we've had COVID because there's a lot more time being spent at home um, pleasuring oneself, I guess. And uh, yeah, so there can be um, some trauma which causes this onset of pain and dysfunction. And it is a type of erectile dysfunction. And a lot of the time we have to, you know, stop guys from masturbating at all and switching off their pornography and then doing a lot of um, pelvic floor sort of relaxation exercises actually and yoga based stretches for their lower back and pelvis, but then that overall um, central nervous system uh, down training and, and, and calming their anxiety around the whole situation. And it can get better. I have patients um, that we work with that it does improve with, but it, it is um, yeah, really tricky uh, for guys dealing with it. Mm, this is an interesting sort of um, thing. And so something that become more recognized recently and you're seeing more cases of and, and do guys come in and say look I think I've caused myself an injury from uh, masturbating too much do they like volunteer that or well I always um, actually just you know get them to give me a little bit of a background and then um, yeah within a minute or two after making them feel hopefully comfortable about 
um, opening up the conversation, they usually, you know, divulge how it starts. And if they if they don't uh, just sort of bring that straight to the forefront of our conversation, I'll, I'll ask them directly, do you remember a time when you felt any pain or did you recall an incident at any time during sexual activity that caused this? And then, then they go on to um, explain in more detail. So they might actually have noticed it while masturbating and that was when it sort of started off and first started being painful yeah because yeah because they can actually bruise themselves as well or get um skin changes and discoloration um redness to the area um yeah oh, okay. a range of different presentations there was it's only sort of like the opposite uh, the first of, of previously where people needed to do pelvic floor exercises but now you're able to teach them more to relax their pelvic floor yeah so in the case where we say their pelvic floor is overactive because they've got um, blood flow that won't um, really from the area, they have to learn to relax their pelvic floor. So we, we normally say, instead of doing that high intensity um, program, we want to really slow it down and we get them in lying down positions. And we ask them to very gently um, squeeze their pelvic floor at about 30 to 50% of their effort and to maybe just do a little two second lift and then a, a four to six second rest and only to do about five of them three or four times a day. And then a whole range of other things um, to help reduce the tension in the area. Yeah, so I thought I read something um, where they thought part of the reason that there may be that semi-erection is that some of those muscles that surround the uh, the erectile tissue. That's more the hidden erectile tissue as opposed to what guys can see uh, in the penis, which gets yes. erect. Most guys know that there's this sort of root to the penis, so half the length of of the erectile tissue is sort of hidden on the bone, and there's muscle that surrounds that, and that maybe there's extra tension in there, and that's preventing um, the the venous exit of of blood out of the uh, the corpus cavernosum. So I thought, yep, correct. Yep. Being somebody who's in the cosmetic field, you know, well, if there's excess tension in a muscle, then maybe we should stick Botox in it. Um, do you know if anybody's ever tried putting Botox into it? I was actually going to ask you that question. Uh, <laughs> we do actually have um, to see if you do it, but yes, we do actually provide that. Um, Botox for males with particularly if they have pelvic pain so they can have something called chronic pelvic pain syndrome which also about six percent of guys who have that problem which is overactivity of the pelvic floor um, have erectile dysfunction issues too so we do provide Botox it's far more commonly done in women we don't have too many practitioners experienced in in males but there are a couple and we do get some benefit but I found it's fairly short term Yes, I've seen a few guys with chronic pelvic or testicular pain. And usually by the time they get to me, they've been through the GP and the urologist and you know, they've especially been checked for um, uh, infections and that sort of thing. And um, with sort of the stranger, slower sort of infections or the non-bacterial. Uh, and once they're cleared of that, there have been some reports of um, injecting Botox into various um, sort of places. So you can inject it into the skin of the scrotum itself. And sometimes guys want that just because they want smoother skin there and let it sag. But of course, yeah. if you're familiar with the, um, the, the skin, the Dartos muscle in the skin of the scrotum doesn't really hold the, um, the testicles up. There's an internal muscle, the cremaster muscle that runs along yes, yes. the chromatic cord and that's what retracts the testicles sort of up in fact if you're a kung fu master you might be able to lift your testicles right up and get kicked in the groin and you know it, it doesn't crumple you to the ground so sometimes we'll inject botox into into that area and yes into the cremaster some, yeah into the cremaster um the problem is the cremaster is surrounded by this network of veins as well so there's always the worry that when you're doing that that you'll just get it into a vein it'll all just flush away and disappear and um you're very right yeah botox sort of then doesn't achieve anything 
Um, but definitely I've seen guys who then one sort of their testicles hang lower and some guys that's a thing and they just would like their testicles to hang lower. And I've seen guys who have then had less pain in the region. Um, but this was before okay. I had yep. ever heard of this um, sort of hard flaccid syndrome and um, right. sort of putting in Botox for that. So yeah, maybe there, there is a role there for, for that. Um, I hope yeah. I don't have a line of okay. guys well, this week. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not. It's not well understood. A lot of the medical, um, even urologists, so there's only been two papers on it: one in 2019 and one in 2020, and they're on case studies. So, it's only really emerging as um, it's actually much more related to the younger population as well. So it's between 18 and 40. So it's definitely a, a newer condition, actually. That um is presenting in in bigger numbers but uh, i guess education once again is um part of the process because if guys have this problem they uh, may be you know really embarrassed about seeking some help for it but by knowing that there is such a true condition that that enables them to get some get some assistance yes well i guess that's what podcasts like these are all about is to put sort of information out there that it's otherwise hard to find um, I'll have to make sure I get those uh, references for the for the two articles off of you. Um, maybe we'll post something in the sure. chat notes and um, yeah, we'll look into what it takes for injecting Botox for a hard flaccid syndrome. Interesting new condition. Okay. Y yes. <laughs> so Joe, is there anything else you'd like to be telling us about physiotherapy for men's sexual health? I just think it's important um, generally that um, if men recognise that they've got any signs of erectile dysfunction that it, and they don't really have any um, understanding of why it might have started to even be considerate of their cardiovascular health. So it's only again in 2019 that the International Society of Sexual Medicine recommended that um, we look at cardiovascular health if there's any history of erectile changes. And that's could be you know just that it's a bit um harder to get or maintain an erection or you notice even a slight bend so peroni's disease uh if there's no trauma can be because of reduced blood flow to the penile arteries so we do know that there's a three-year window where men may have signs of erectile dysfunction that could potentially lead to a heart attack for example so um i think going well, on to your that, that, dr joe that, um no, they they recognise that their um their erectile function is um is fading and that worries them so much they have a heart attack. <laughs> no, no, okay. um, it's it's actually that there's pathological changes. So the signs of um, uh, erectile dysfunction to the smaller arteries is often indicative of the um, atherosclerotic changes in the bigger arteries. So we get them to get the coronary calcium score and that can be quite, you know, often a, a silent um, heart attack with a few vessels narrowing and some calcification. So yeah, no, it's not about the worry. It's actually a true pathological situation where things change over yeah. a three year so window to the point coronary, where- The coronary calcium score, that's where they have a, a CT scan of their actual heart and they actually give a number to how much calcium is starting to build up in the arteries that go to your heart. And that's a indicator of risk of a heart attack. Yeah, correct. Yep. Yeah. Yes. We often explain it to guys that, and I'm not sure if it's hundred percent true that the arteries leading into your penis are a similar size to the arteries that uh, go to supply the blood to your heart. So if you're yeah, developing this atherosclerotic, the plaques thickening, uh, in the wall of your penile artery, then it's happening in your heart. And uh, they're both equally important and you've got to check them both out. Yeah, because I, I made up the phrase, your heart health and your hard health are related. Oh, you're good at this, aren't you? Hard, hard health and heart <laughs> health. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. We'll, 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 I'll try and remember that and um, uh, be passing that on, that your heart health and your hard health are related. Excellent. Thank you for that. Well, well, we've learned some really interesting things. We've learned about having our, our nuts to our guts. 
uh, how men have pelvic floors and it's important to um, exercise it and that exercising it actually makes a difference and you can improve your um, your continence and your erectile function uh, and that you have a full physio program for it. So that's um, that's wonderful. And then about this strange new and becoming perhaps more common uh, condition of, of hard flaccid syndrome. So thank you very much. Thanks. For yes. Being no worries at all. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And it's nice to have a chat about, you know, issues that, you know, every, every man could potentially face in his lifetime and, and that there's lots of non-invasive ways of actually assisting. Yep. And if people uh, want to listen to another penis podcast, which I would recommend, uh, then check out the Penis Project, uh, which has a website, a Penis Project website, and uh, wherever you get uh, your podcasts, there's the, uh, the Penis Project podcast as well. And um, especially if uh, you're somebody who has had uh, prostate surgery or looking at having prostate surgery or any kind of functional issue there, there's a wealth of information, lots and lots of content there, all about penises. And thank you very much for that. No worries. It's, we, we do actually um, interview patients as well. So often mm. Melissa Hadley Barrett, my co-host and I, we um, see lots of mutual patients and we will, um, if we have something that comes up that's a little bit differently, we'll um, just ask. And it's really nice to get that perspective from the, the man himself rather than us two females who never go through things. So yeah, the Penis Project is all about um, demystifying issues in men's health. That's a great thing to do. And on that note, uh, I think we'll finish. Thank you very much, Dr. Joe. Thank you so much, Jason.